Good evening, Dr. Phil here. Today we will be discussing on the larynx. The larynx functions to protect the airway from contamination. It is also an organ of phonation. The upper border is the base of the tongue, lower border is the trachea. It lies opposite the third to the sixth cervical vertebra. In the adult female and in children, it lies higher, comprises of a number of articulating cartilages joined by ligaments, subject to actions of various muscles. Cartilaginous framework comprises of the thyroid, cricoid, arytenoid, corniculate, and cuneiform cartilages. The thyroid cartilage consists of two quadrilateral laminae, which are fused anteriorly to form the laryngeal prominence, and it articulates inferiorly with the cricoid. The thyroid notch lies at the level of C4. The cricoid cartilage is a continuous ring with a narrow anterior arch and a deeper posterior lamina. It articulates on each side with the inferior cornu of the thyroid cartilage and with the base of the arytenoid cartilage. Each of the pet arytenoid cartilages are pyramidal in shape. It has a concave base that articulates with the cricoid cartilage. The lateral angle or muscular process projects backwards. The anterior angle or vocal process projects forwards. The apex articulates with the corniculate cartilage. The two corniculate cartilages are small nodules, sometimes fused with the arytenoids, and lie in the posterior airy epiglottic folds of the mucous membrane. The two cuneiform cartilages lie anterior to the corniculate cartilages and are also within the airy epiglottic fold. Intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments of anesthetic interest includes the thyrohyoid membrane which joins the upper border of the thyroid cartilage to the hyoid bone and the cricothyroid ligament which lies between the cricoid and the thyroid cartilages. The vocal cords, also known as the vocal folds, are opalescent folds of mucous membrane that extends from the anterior vocal process of the arytenoid cartilages to as far as the middle of the angle of the thyroid cartilage. The vestibular folds, or false cords, lie lateral to the cords and comprises of thicker folds of mucous membranes and extend from the thyroid cartilage to the arytenoids. The laryngeal muscles consist of extrinsic and intrinsic muscles. The extrinsic muscles attach the larynx to adjacent structures. Examples include the sternothyroid, thyrohyoid, inferior constrictor of the pharynx. The intrinsic muscles are of more immediate interest to the anesthetist as they control the opening of the vocal cords during inspiration and the closure of the vocal cords and the laryngeal inlet during swallowing and the tension of the cords during speech. The cricothyroid and vocalis tenses up the cords. The thyroarytenoid relaxes the cords. The lateral cricoarytenoid helps in adduction of the cords along with the transverse arytenoid. And the posterior cricoarytenoids help in the abduction of the vocal cords. All the muscles of the larynx are innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve except for the cricothyroid muscle which is supplied by the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Factors affecting the ease of laryngoscopy Anesthetists have long sought a test or a combination of tests that has a high sensitivity and specificity for predicting difficult intubation, but none has yet been found. The Cormac and Lehan classification describes the best view obtained at laryngoscopy, which includes grade 1 full view, grade 2 
posterior part of the glottis visible only, grade 3, epiglottis visible only, and grade 4, only the soft palate is visible. Increasing grades will predict more difficult laryngoscopy and intubation. The larynx can be seen directly only if there is a single direct plane of view. All three axes must be brought into alignment, the axis of the oral cavity, the pharynx, and the larynx. This is done by opening the mouth wide, flexing the neck, extending the head at the alanto occipital joint, and lifting the base of the tongue and epiglottis upwards and forwards in direct laryngoscopy. Factors which impedes this alignment will make direct laryngoscopy and intubation more difficult. Such factors include limited mouth opening of less than 4 cm, prominent upper incisors, maxillary pronathism, inability to protrude the lower incisors in front of the upper, limited neck mobility with restricted extension, thyromental distance of less than 6.5 cm, and sternomental distance of less than 12.5 cm, or a high anterior larynx. Obesity is often cited as a factor, but studies in patients undergoing bariatric surgery have demonstrated no difference in laryngoscopic view between the morbidly obese and those patients of normal body habitus. Pregnancy as well do not in themselves impede the ability to obtain a single axis plane of view between the incisor and the glottis. Other predictors of difficult laryngoscopy has been described such as the radiological assessment of the alanto occipital gap, the C1-C2 gap, the anterior-posterior depth of the mandible. These are of limited clinical use as such radiographs are rarely available or requested. Recognizing structures that are seen at direct laryngoscopy, this diagram shows what is visible during direct laryngoscopy. Beyond the elevated epiglottis are the false and true vocal cords. Posteriorly are the arytenoid cartilages, together with the bulges of the corniculate and cuneiform cartilages. Between the cords is the laryngeal inlet or rima glottidis, beyond which may be visible the upper rings of the trachea. The arytenoids can be dislocated or sublax during tracheal intubation or laryngeal mass insertion, and it may result in the interference with the function of some of the intrinsic muscles and may compromise the airway. The crico arytenoid joint may be also affected by systemic inflammatory arthropathy such as rheumatoid arthritis and by tissue changes associated with acromegaly. The anatomy of the cricot cartilage is relevant for rapid sequence induction of anesthesia and emergency access to the airway such as in cricothyroidotomy. Next, we move on to the innervation of the larynx. The sensory innervation. The sensory innervation of the larynx is via the vagus nerve, which divides into the superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve. The superior laryngeal nerve divides further into the internal and external branch. The internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, also known as the internal laryngeal nerve, innervates the inferior surface of the epiglottis and the supraglottic region as far as the mucous membrane above the vocal cords. The recurrent laryngeal nerve provides the sensory supply to the laryngeal mucosa below the vocal cords. Motor innervation. The recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies all the intrinsic muscles of the larynx, with the exception of the cricothyroid muscle, which is supplied from the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. The right recurrent laryngeal nerve leaves the vagus to loop beneath the subclavian artery before ascending to the larynx in a groove between the esophagus and the trachea. The left recurrent laryngeal nerve passes beneath the arch of the aorta and ascends in the groove between the esophagus and the trachea. Clinical consequences of the injury of the laryngeal nerves. The external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve 
supplies the cricothyroid muscle, which tenses the vocal cords. Damage will be followed by hoarseness of voice. If the injury is unilateral, this hoarseness will be temporary because in time, the other cricothyroid muscle will compensate. If it is bilateral, the hoarseness will be permanent. The recurrent laryngeal nerve supplies all those muscles which control the opening and closing of the laryngeal inlet. Partial paralysis results in hoarseness of voice and affects the abductor muscles more than the adductors. With unilateral injury, the corresponding vocal cord is paralyzed. If both nerves are damaged, then both cords oppose or even overlap each other in the midline, leading to inspiratory stridor and has the potential to cause total respiratory obstruction. If one or both nerves are transacted, the vocal cords adopt the cadaveric position, they lie partially abducted and through which airflow is much less compromised. Phonation may be reduced to a whisper. Anesthesia for awake fiber optic intubation. There are a few methods available. Nebulized lidocaine, topical anesthetic, spray as you go technique, and nerve blocks. Nebulized lidocaine using lidocaine 4% provides adequate surface anesthesia of the airway. The procedure will take some time and the patient might find the mask claustrophobic and uncomfortable and it may not anesthetize the nasal mucosa adequately. Therefore, the nasal mucosa can be anesthetized with local anesthetic such as topical cocaine with a maximum dose of 1.5 mg per kg with a vasoconstrictor to minimize bleeding. If oral intubation is planned, the tongue and posterior pharynx can be anesthetized by lidocaine 4% or a lidocaine 10% metered pump which delivers 10 mg with each spray. Spray as you go technique involves local anesthetic such as lidocaine 4% introduced via the injector channel in the fiber optic endoscope under direct vision. Nerve blocks. There are three nerves that need to be blocked, the glossopharyngeal nerve, superior laryngeal nerve, and recurrent laryngeal nerve. The glossopharyngeal nerve provides sensory innovation to the oral pharynx, supraglottic area, and the base of the tongue, and the vellicula. It is blocked by submucosal infiltration behind the tonsillar pillars. The superior laryngeal nerve can be anesthetized by bilateral injections either by walking off the greater cornua of the hyoid to penetrate the tyrohyoid membrane or walking off the superior alley of the thyroid cartilage. The recurrent laryngeal nerve is usually blocked in a spray-as-you-go technique. It can be also blocked through a transtracheal injection through the cricothyroid membrane during inspiration and the cough will distribute the solution around 4 mL of lidocaine 4% widely. These are my references. Thank you.